Well, it's great to see you here uh, once again as we look at the book of Colossians. Remember that Colossians focuses on the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Colossians uh, focuses on Christ, his deity, and who he is, and all he has done for us. The book of Ephesians, remember, focused on the church. The book of Philippians focuses on the church, doing the walking uh, through conduct and behavior. And of course, the book of Colossians now focuses on the head. I do want to start back in verse one. I only want to read up through where we began tonight in verse 11. But I want to go back to verse 1, the greeting where Paul, uh, he greets the, the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened, here we are for tonight, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. In verse 11 here, he speaks about, now Paul is praying. And uh, he's praying for the things that he wants to happen for these Colossian Christians. And of course, you see in those verses that we have read in the preceding verses uh, before verse 11, how he speaks about Jesus Christ on more than one occasion there because he's speaking about Christ being the head the body of the body of Christ. Christ is the preeminent Christ. He said strengthened with might. He wanted them to be strengthened with might. You and I are strengthened with might from God through the Holy Spirit who is the one that gives us uh, the ability and the power to do what we do. Notice he said, according to his, speaking of God through the Holy Spirit, his glorious power. Tonight, it's because of the glorious power of the resurrected Christ that enables you and me through the Holy Spirit that lives within our hearts. To be, in, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be able to carry on uh, the work of the Lord that we would be uh, filled with all knowledge and wisdom and all spiritual understanding. He said, strengthened with all might. Uh, there are days, I think, that all of us, if we are honest with ourselves, there are times in our lives that we don't feel too strengthened. How many of you at various moments and times in your life, you just felt overpressured and overwhelmed with the load and the weight of the world and all of the uh, situations and the circumstances with which you are confronted on a daily basis? Let me tell you, in a world that is ever changing that you and I are living in today, we need to be strengthened 
with all might according to his glorious power. Aren't you grateful tonight for the power of the Holy Spirit? The power of God that lives within your heart and life that can give you courage in the midst of disappointment, that can give you comfort in the midst of all of the things that you're experiencing in life with all of the losses that you encounter. And I'm grateful as he is writing about the preeminent Christ because as I have alluded to on several nights of our study in first Christian, uh, uh, first century Christianity, there were all kinds of cults and heresies going on. And we'll look at more of those as we come to verse 15. But he brings up the importance here of Christ being the preeminent one. And uh, how that we are empowered through, according to his glorious power. And then he says, for all patience and understanding. Let me tell you, we, we are strengthened uh, by his might, according to his glorious power, uh, for all patience. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you a patient person? Does your patience wear thin? Does your patience, you know, there are some people that honestly, I think, have the gift of patience. And in every situation, I just want you to think back in your mind. Go back to the vault in your mind and pull up a file that you remember a specific person who just seemed to have all the patience in all of the world. Can you think of somebody? Can you think of somebody that you know that had patience and in the midst of their patience, they were filled with joy? Let me tell you, if we just looked at our world tonight, it would not be a very joyous world. It certainly would not be a happy world because of all of the happenstances with which we are confronted with. But let me tell you, when you and I are strengthened by the power of the glorious strength of the Lord, let me tell you, that's why Paul would say in the book of Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul realized that in all of his challenges, in all of the things that he had experienced, his imprisonment, beaten with rods, living out in the cold waters, shipwrecked in, in the deep, uh, even uh, bitten by a serpent over there in the book of Acts, and, and the various things that he experienced in life. Where on earth did he get his joy? How many of us would be singing at midnight as he and Silas were in a prison realizing what was going on? And so oftentimes in our lives, we're not patient. We are not patient with answers to our prayers, are we? How many of us pray? And, you know, because we live in an instant society, we live in a very computerized, high-tech society that the click of a mouse, you know, instantly you've got the information that you need or that you are looking for. Or, or anymore, families don't eat at the table like they used to because they go through drive-throughs or else they pop something in the microwave and, you know, uh, in a few minutes or seconds... Your food can be ready. Most of us are not patient people because we've grown up into an impatient world that we live in. Sometimes in life, God puts us in situations whereby we have to learn to be patient. Many of us fail that test. Many of us never are successful in accomplishing the patience that the Holy Spirit would have us to have. And oftentimes, I see elderly people that are uh, experiencing all kinds of health issues. Sometimes their children are patient with them. Other times, their children are not patient with them. The same with grandparents. You see... Paul realized that the Colossian Christians, uh, 
if they were going to walk worthy of the Lord, if they were going to be fully pleasing to him, if they were going to be fruitful in every uh, good work, and if they were going to be increasing in the knowledge of God, they had to be strengthened with the power, the glorious power of the might of the resurrected Christ. He said, for all patience and long-suffering. You see, tonight, God has been long-suffering since Calvary 2,000 years ago. I could not help but think as I was reflecting on the scripture, as I was reading some news articles about evangelicals, some of the top ones that you would know if I called their names tonight. In one of the articles that I was reading, it was really denunciatory to these evangelicals and how they had stood a certain way in uh, the political realm. And as I was reading that, let me tell you, the world that you and I live in at large is not a patient world. It's not a long-suffering world. And I could not help but think that the Christ, the Christ who died on the cross 2,000 years ago, and you know, the Bible says that, that men will say in the last times, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, things continue as they are. You know, I thought about that and I thought, well, I'll tell you why he hasn't come. He's still waiting for that last person that the Holy Spirit will bring to a place of conversion uh, and conviction of sin and that will be saved in the church age, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> the age of grace that you and I are living in since Calvary. Let me tell you, he is a patient God. He's patient with us when we are not patient. We're oftentimes not patient with each other. I think patience certainly is a gifting. Some people are just blessed with, and the rest of us have to work at that. But he speaks about for all patience and long-suffering, that Christ is the long-suffering one. He's given me an opportunity for 2,000 years to reach out through faith and receive his gift of eternal life, his gift of grace, that unmerited favor that you and I cannot earn, we cannot pay, we cannot work for. We just have to reach out through faith and receive that into our heart and life. Christ is long-suffering. When people say, I cannot believe that a good God, a God of love, many people will say, I can believe in a God of love, but I cannot believe in a God of wrath and judgment. Let me tell you, people will oftentimes say, I can't believe that a good loving God would send anyone to hell. Let me tell you, a good loving God does not send anyone to hell, they send themselves because they reject, they reject the truth of the gospel. They reject the crucified Christ who shed his blood for the remission of sin and arose from the grave triumphantly and who is the living hope of the world. Paul prays about this church and that ought to be our heart cry. That ought to be the battle cry of New Hope Church that we pray this prayer here about the preeminent Christ in verses 9 and following that Paul prayed for the strength of these Christians in a time when their faith was being challenged, in a time when there were false religions, <clears throat> pardon me, creeping into uh, the church. And then in verse uh, 12, Paul once again refers back to this thankfulness. You and I are looking next week. A week from tomorrow will be Thanksgiving Day. This will be a different Thanksgiving than uh, all the Thanksgivings you and I probably ever remember in our lifetimes. In fact, it's amazing when you listen to the media and how they're requesting people not to get together or for the few that they want to get together, they're asking each one to bring their own food. And so a very different time 
that you and I are living in. Many families that need that camaraderie of fellowship and family ship and connection. Uh, many, many of them will probably not have that uh, depending upon what they choose to do or not do. But I want you to know as Paul says here in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. Let me tell you, you and I need to give thanks to the Father. The church at Colossae needed to give thanks to the Father. Let me tell you, New Hope Duncan needs to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Notice, who has qualified us. You and I cannot qualify ourselves. He qualified us. Notice, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Let me tell you, aren't you grateful tonight that you are a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light? I'm grateful tonight that even though I live in a darkened world, I am not a darkened person because I have the light of Christ in my heart of life. Let me tell you, the song says the whole world was lost in the darkness of sin, but the light of the world is Jesus. And the Colossian Christians were saints. They were in Christ, and they were in the light, and they were walking in the light. And Paul wanted them to continue to walk in the light. He wanted them to continue to be grateful and to be thankful. Even though Thanksgiving comes next Thursday, let me tell you, every saint of God ought to have a heart of thanks every day. Amen. I mean, we ought to be thankful if we can uh, wake up in the morning and get out of bed and put on our clothes and, and go to work or do whatever we do. We ought to be thankful. We ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful to pick up the word of God and open the word of God and to read the word of God and to know that this is absolute. It is absolute truth. The word of God. He says in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. And he wants them to understand with all of the other um, cults and religions that were out there vying for first place. That their faith was in none other than Christ himself. And he wanted them to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Let me tell you, when you think of Calvary tonight, do you realize that it was Calvary's cross, the shed blood of Christ, the resurrected Christ that qualified you and me to be a partaker of the inheritance that we have of eternal life. What a blessing that we have and then in verse 13, Paul moves on and says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Let me tell you, this world's pretty dark tonight, isn't it? It's pretty bleak. It's pretty doomed. And without the hope of Christ, there would absolutely be a hopeless world that would be sunk into the darkness of sin tonight. But notice verse 13, Paul reiterates to the Colossi church the importance of Christ and his preeminence and him being the head of the church. He said, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and notice and conveyed and conveyed, notice that word there, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Let me tell you, the kingdom of God, God's kingdom is going on forever and forever and forever. And it is he that has made us partakers. It is he that has translated us out of darkness into this glorious kingdom. And notice he says, into the kingdom of the Son, speaking of Jesus Christ, of his love. You and I 
can only do what we can do because we have been conveyed into this kingdom. We've been translated out of darkness into the wonderful light of the grace of Almighty God into this kingdom. And then he says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now I'm going to close with this verse for tonight, but something I think that is vitally important for you and me to see. There are lots of, there are lots of places tonight that no longer sing about the blood of Jesus. Let me tell you, there have been, there have been denominations that have excluded the blood from their hymnals. And I want you to know Paul wanted this church to understand the importance of redemption, what it took to convey us, what it took to translate us, what it took to make us partakers of the inheritance of this wonderful kingdom. And it took redemption. We could not redeem ourselves. He says, in whom, speaking of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption. To redeem something means to take it from bondage, from slavery. We have redemption, and the way we have that is through his blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus, we sing, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of of Jesus. Let me tell you, when churches fail to sing about the blood of Christ, let me tell you, they fail Christ. They fail in their witness and their endeavor to be able to share the wonderful gift of eternal life that only comes through the redemption of Christ's blood on the cross. And that's the only way there is forgiveness of sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. And Paul, in this doctrinal chapter in Colossians, he sets forth in chapter 1 and chapter 2 doctrinal teachings to refute those cults those re religions that have invaded the church that are trying to stifle the kingdom of God. And uh, Gnosticism was one of them. Uh, Gnostic or Gnosticism, that was one of the earliest ones. Arianism was one area. of Alexander, he uh, uh, said that Christ was a created being that that God, that, that there was a creation and finally on down from creature to creature to creature, finally one was Jesus Christ. If you can only imagine, Arius of Alexander, the Council of Nicaea, uh, put the nail in that coffin by letting them know that God is very God and God is very man. He is the God man. And, uh, so the deity of Christ was so vitally important. And then Socinus, one of the other heresies, would come to uh, say that Jesus could not be God. And so it contradicted the deity of Christ. So you can understand when Epaphras, the pastor, the leader of the church at Colossae, when he went to the Roman prison to see Paul and to share with him some things that were happening, you can understand why Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned the words to the Colossian church to debunk these mythical, false teachings that uh, were inherent in the city of of Colossae and were infiltrating the church. And it was vitally important that the Colossian Christians understand about the deity of Christ. 
that Jesus was God in human flesh. And it's through redemption and the shed blood of Christ that there is forgiveness of sins. There are a lot of people that say, well, I don't want to hear about a bloody religion. Well, folks, let me tell you, if you don't want to hear about a bloody religion that took place on Calvary, it wasn't a religion, it was a relationship. It's called Christianity. A Christian is one who is a Christ follower. And Christ was fully God in human flesh, in the incarnation, the word God became flesh and dwelt among us, John said. So Paul very expressly says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The blood. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses you and me from all unrighteousness. God bless you for being here tonight. We'll pick up Sunday evening in verse 15 and we'll talk about some of those false uh, religions that were there as Paul instructs once again as he challenges these uh, Colossian Christians to keep the faith and to keep on keeping on. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you stand as we pray together and as we go this evening? Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity we've had to come tonight and to study your word together. God, just keep, keep us close to you. Keep us, oh God, studying your word. Keep us proclaiming the message of salvation. And Father, we thank you, we praise you because of redemption through your blood for the forgiveness of sin. In Christ's name we pray, amen.